Today, we will pick up where we left off. We uh, were talking about this state seal, this unique state seal that Alabama has that features its rivers. And then we're going to move on to uh, how rivers form, which is code for some basic river geology, the so-called stage that the rivers flow across, and how our geological history has affected our rivers. And then uh, talk a bit about people in rivers, meaning a broad sweep of human history in Alabama. Uh, I've, if you know the way I've done this in the past, this is different. And my, my reasoning this year, I got to thinking about it, I really want to couple the uh, topography, the physiography of Alabama with human settlement. Like how and when and why did we come and where did we land? You know, I think Sonny Dossie calls that cultural geography, but um, I'm just calling it people and rivers. Again, uh, emphasizing the very strong emphasis, the, the very strong influence that rivers have had on, on people for millennia. So here's where we left off, uh, and I ask you to be thinking a little bit about why our territorial governor, William Wyatt Bibb, who became our state governor at statehood in December of 1819, why he came up with this design uh, a year or two out from statehood. You see, this does not say the state of Alabama yet. This is still just the official territorial seal that was later adopted for our state seal. But um, I wondered if there was just one or maybe two or more ideas, and, and you don't have to get too, you know, in the weeds about it, just basic, like, why when, if you've ever seen George's, you know, there's a soldier with a rifle, and there's a, I think there's a scholar, you know, with a book, and there's, there's scales, and there's all these wonderful, virtuous words of justice and liberty, and, but we have a very simple one, you know, we were not the first state by any stretch, but um, so there were a lot of precedents, but then why did we come up with this very simple rivers map seal? Any, any ideas? Any thoughts? Yes, Jim. Football has not been invented by the way. Okay. That's true. That's true. There, there are <laughs> that, that is a, a good start. A good start. <laughs> any other? Mm-hmm. Right. Okay, I'm sorry. I will repeat the comments and questions because of the acoustics here. Uh, she said that you can hardly travel anywhere in the state without bumping into a river. <laughs> so maybe if, you know, correct me if I'm misinterpreting you, but it's just that rivers were so obvious, so abundant, that it characterized who we were. Okay? Okay? Yes, Mark. Mm -hmm. Also commerce, you know, mm -hmm. and trade and so forth, but also maybe beauty, appreciation. Mm -hmm. People who live on water love water. Right. And, you know, especially that's true today. That's why I think of it as the many meanings of the state seal. You know, if we take an iconic symbol like the American flag or the Bible or the Constitution or the Confederate flag or whatever, it evokes things. That's why they're so controversial, right? That's why we... We kick up some dust about them. So a symbol to be endearing and enduring has to be living. It has to morph into who we are. We, we take our identity or we, you know, it's, a, it's an iterative thing. We um, maybe can see how symbols change over time. You know, they may guide us. They may have a foundation that we would like to adhere to, but Times change, culture change, social things change, and so we may uh, have many meanings to our state seal. So we, we got two going here, one, well, maybe three. One, one is just the obvious description of who we are. We are a river state. And then secondly, Marge mentioned too, actually commerce. Uh, water was, you know, the lifeblood for the economy, especially before railroads, before big superhighways, uh, and then she mentioned beauty. So 
we've got a few things going, and I think there's another one. In, yes? Attracted settlers, too. Yes, it attracted settlers. It attracted settlers for several ways, and we'll get to those. I won't go into them now. We'll get to them in people in rivers. So, yes, it was a, a magnet. You know, it drew people. Um, He was the governor. Um, if you mean what he did besides being a politician, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, most were gentlemen planters, but does anyone really know? William Wyatt Bibb? You had to be a person of means, you had to be landed, you know, back in the day. Uh, didn't hurt to be an old white guy. Um, so, yeah, maybe that, that's a good question we need to chase. Yes? Yes, yes. Yes. Yes, isn't that true? Water is life, as we say. So you have the drinking water, you have the aquatic resources. We'll look at that. There's been some amazing uh, discoveries, even in recent years, uh, about how Native Americans used rivers for food. Uh, so transportation, food, drinking water, washing, you know, the whole deal. So, yeah, so we'll uh, pursue that a little bit. Um, so while I'm here, I have a, one quick presidential trivia question. Last night we had the State of the Union. Uh, this symbol was sent by Bibb to John Quincy Adams, who was Secretary of State. Then the capital of the country was in Philadelphia. James Monroe was the president. But soon thereafter, Adams became president after after Monroe. So the question I have for you in reference to John Quincy Adams and our president, what unique attribute do Presidents John Quincy Adams and Donald Trump share? They're the only two presidents that share one thing. You have to really rack your brain for that. <laughs> scared to say, thank you, thank you. Discretion is the better part of valor. You know, you could say a lot. I had a lot of, you know, tongue in cheek answers. The answer is, whoops, sorry. The answer is they are the only two whose wives were foreign born. Adams married a Frenchman, a French woman. <laughs> uh, and of course, Donald Trump has a wife, I believe, from Hungary now. So anyways, they were the only two who, whose wives were not born in the US. OK, so that symbol started to show up on official documents. Uh, this is a later one. This is actually from the 1860s. But uh, the, the raised seal is, is here. And uh, what I mentioned last week was David Robb, who's an art historian, went in and found a certificate from 1819 in our archive. And it was appointing a county clerk to Otago County. And the symbol looked like that, the seal. It looked like, well, that's long gone. And he used some technology, and he brought that seal back. It was phenomenally detailed, what he could do. And so we got a glimpse for the first time in almost 200 years of what that symbol was. But by the 1860s and well before, there was another symbol, and it was a map of the rivers uh, rolled up and nailed to a tree. And it even has a lot of the features of our state seal uh, to where it had to have been based on that, on that original drawing. There was a little French settlement out on the Tom Bigby River that was there. There was a dot where the early surveyors started doing the Mississippi line. And, and I, I, that dot, I think, to me, represents an expletive where the surveyor realized that if he kept that course, that Alabama was going to be a whole lot bigger than Mississippi. And Congress said, make it equal. So at that dot, the line of our state veers to the east, to the northeast. And uh, we'll get into that. How, how that shape came. 
But anyways, that little dot is also, if you look closely, if you, if you had the opportunity, it's right there, in fact. And so, as it turns out, from what I've read, this symbol was much more generally known than this symbol. The reason being, the average Alabamian had very little official business. They didn't really get the raised seal, but this was in all the textbooks and around public offices, and, and so that's what most Alabamians related to, and it just alluded to, to this seal. So here they are up close, the official seal. Here's that dot where they, you know, where it changed from due north to a northeast course, and that dot is there, very prominent. <laughs> uh, that kind of crazy Tennessee Valley line, they look like bear teeth here, but they even put Tennessee upside down, even though it was part of Alabama. You know, it's funny how they related, but Anyways, just you could, you could fall into these symbols and really study them and think about them. But um, just to point out, this is the official 1817, and that's the unofficial scrolled Alabama map on tree, the more commonly known one. Okay, then, you know, that went on from 1819, went on for about 50 years through the Civil War. But after the war, the symbol suddenly changed. And this is the Great Seal of Alabama from the archives from December 1868. And so that raises another question, why did we lose the river seal? And many people think it was a little bit of retribution. It was bringing Alabama back into the fold, uh, making them part of the United States after secession, uh, giving them, or maybe I should say, imposing upon Alabama, you know, a more conventional symbol, get with the program, here's your eagle, here's your banner, you know, that kind of thing. And I've never heard a real clear treatment of that myself. I've asked some historians, and um, maybe there's someone here that knows, or someone that knows someone that would know, but it was just interesting that there was that abrupt change. And this symbol stayed for longer than the first one. This one lasted 70 years. And, and so um, sometime about 1930, this was officially adopted by the legislature in 31, the Alabama State Song, written by Julia Tutwiler. And in it, I'm just raising an intriguing question. The first two verses mention six of the main rivers, the Tennessee, uh, the Alabama, which is the stream whose name thou bearest, the Big B, Tom Big B, the Coosa, the Tallapoosa, the Warrior. So obviously rivers were very much in the consciousness of people, first two verses of the state song. And I just thought, you know, it was interesting to me that this was done in the 1930s. We still had that here we rest eagle symbol, but there was a campaign to restore the symbol. And in uh, 1939, that was accomplished. So less than a decade after the state song was adopted, maybe it started to work on us again, you know? We were singing about rivers, we were experiencing the beauty and the economy and the, you know, just the cultural attributes of rivers. And so in 39, this is what was brought back, the Alabama Great Seal. And it's very similar to Bibb's drawing. In fact, in some ways it's more similar in that he, he listed the Black Warrior River, and if you recall from that previous first seal, it was called the Tuscaloosa River. There were other things changed. He spelled Cahaba the way we do today. The original seal had the W, the Cahaba, and things like that. So it's, it was a mix, but it's uncanny how similar this seal was to uh, his original. And then in the 50s, uh, it was colorized to the one we have today. So, and prettied up a little bit. You, you can see it's, it's very, very similar though. Uh, and so that's kind of the story of the, of the uh, seal. Although, um, going back to the economy, from what I've read among historians, you know, we think of rivers, you know, Harold Banks kayak or canoed the entire length of the Tallapoosa River. And, you know, I'm sure, when you say Tallapoosa to Harold, it evokes a lot of things that 
maybe Bibb didn't have a clue about, or even the early settlers, you know. They were streaming into Alabama, uh, sometimes on water, often using the Federal Road. When, when Thomas Jefferson bought the Louisiana Purchase in the early 1800s, they wanted a, a postal road to kind of come into uh, New Orleans from the East Coast, and so that road kind of sliced across Alabama. When it was created around 18, between 1800 and 1810, people just streamed into it, you know, uh, as we think about people in rivers a little bit later, we'll get into it more. But um, I've read where between 1810 and 1820, the population of Alabama grew tenfold. And largely, it is believed that that river map was a way of saying, you know, you come to Alabama, you have fertile bottomland, you can make a boatload of money with cotton, and you can get that product out to markets. You can get it to Boston, you can get it to New York, you can get it to London, and you don't have to go through any other state. It, it's just this magical network. And it would be like Eisenhower did in the 50s, the superhighway system, or what we're doing today with our advanced telecommunications and super fast internet. It's attractive. People can come, they can communicate, they can, you know, have commerce. And so I think that economic driver was, was a big one, if not the main one, in the, in the founder's mind when they made this seal. Uh, among other things, a lot of the soil, yes, sir? Yes, I do not know. Six stars. Is it just balance or design, or was there a symbolism there? See, that's what I mean. We could really get into this. There are so many. There's, I, I, you know, I don't want to take the whole class on this, so I don't get into the, the ones I've been chewing on, but there's a lot of little subtleties in these that you knew someone had to have intention when they drew it, but why did they put it there? You know? So I, I do not know, and if anybody finds out, let's share it. Yes, sir? Well, it could be. Let's see. I think they said 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. I count 9. If you, if you take, you know, the P1, the Koneka 2, 3, 4. Sorry? Oh, and the Tennessee? Yeah. Well, well, let's look into it. That's your assignment for next week. <laughs> okay, so I just want to end this with uh, just a story that I love. Uh, my daughter lives in Montgomery with her husband and four kids, and she had a good friend who taught elementary school. And so when they knew I was writing about this in uh, a book, she said, I've got to tell you this story. He said, I, I teach the fourth grade. We have an Alabama history module. And we were talking about the seal. So I told my students, go home tonight. You know, this seal has many versions. You know, Department of Transportation, or when you pump gas, the seal that they verify weights and measures. The, the, the river map is, is, you know, the theme of many, many variations on, on uh, different agency uh, logos. So she thought, this is going to be an easy assignment. She sent her fourth graders home. Find me just any picture that, that shows the Alabama seal. So the next day, all the kids came, and they had all the different varieties, except for one child had a, a note from home. And the, and the parents said, you know, we, we spent hours on the Internet. We looked long and hard for an Alabama seal, and we just don't think that this animal exists in the state. <laughs> and so... They sent in a picture. She sent a picture of a river otter. She said, would this serve as a substitute? Because it looks kind of like a seal, you know? And that's a true story from a fourth grade teacher. But what caught me, the river guy, you know, even a humorous misunderstanding goes back to the river, you know? Official river otter. So, um, so, this is another way of seeing the basins. We talked about them last week a bit. But again, just to give you that, 
overview. Uh, starting uh, week after next, we're going to you know, look at the Tennessee and this green coastal plain, including this part, the Escatapa River, part of the Pascagoula here, and then this series of Alabama coastal rivers. And then we're going to just take them in twos and threes and, and cover the basins, the Tom Bigby, the Black Warrior, the Cahaba, the Coosa, Tallapoosa, Alabama, Chattahoochee, and Tennessee. So, a little bit about how rivers form, the geology, you know. Some of you have seen this, this chart in uh, Mike's class or other places, and it, it becomes almost laughable to the lay person, you know, because you're looking at this and, okay, I think I remember these three big ones, but then they're broken down and they're broken down and they're broken down and you're into all these totally unpronounceable words that you have no idea what they mean and you think, no wonder I didn't major in geology, you know? And I think about it, this is the way they look at time and this is the way we look at, at the chart, you know, like, are you for real? Um, that people spend their lives, you know, doing this. And how in the world would you know if you pick up a rock how old it is and all of that? But in fact, you know, I've warmed up to geology a good bit. I think I would be one in my next life. Um, but the, it is quite complicated. So I think the big hurdle is the concept of deep time, you know, immense time. We, we just can't, you know, 100 years, you can kind of think about it, your grandparents or something. But you get much beyond that, it just kind of goes into the haze, you know. Along with that is, is a Gallup poll which said that 42% of Americans believe the Earth is 10,000 years old and that it is a deeply satisfying story to them. So there, there is a lot of, you know, various beliefs, religious beliefs, uh, philosophical beliefs, whatever, um, our views of science, um, that, that perhaps um, obscure what geologists are trying to say. So I put it into three, um, three different simpler ideas maybe to help us. If, you know, you speak of a billion, like they say our universe 14.6 billion, the Earth is four and a half billion years. And I always say, well, you know, if you, if you had a real big gathering of a billion people and you had to get them out of the room quick and you were going to just take a second to shake their hands, like, good to see you, get lost, see you, bye, bye, bye. One second each. To get the billion people out of the room, one second each would take 32 years. So it just, it just kind of blows your mind. You know, you think, oh, if we had this huge gathering, a big convention or a mega church or something, a billion people, you know, it might take me half a day to get them out of the room. Well, it'd take you 32 years in a second a person. So that's, that's one thing. So the age of the earth, if you just sat here after class and said, I'm just going to count to the age of the earth, you know, good luck, 140 years it would take you, one a second. So that's how many seconds are in 4.6. If the timeline of the universe were represented by a 146-foot rope, chosen because of that 14.6 billion, you know, you could wrap 146 foot rope around this room a couple times. Homo sapiens from the earliest would be less than an eighth of an inch at the end of the rope. So, you know, again, you, we did this in class once. Some of you may have been there. Jan and I taught a class where we did the cosmic walk, and I literally had 146 foot rope in the room with the marks, you know, the Big Bang and the first life and the dinosaurs and so on. And, you, and you're walking and you say, hey, where's the people, where's the people, where's the people? And you could hardly find them on the fringe of the end of the rope, you know? Very humbling. Some people were deeply moved by that. And then, going back to uh, Jim Barber's thought, you know, if the Earth's history were represented by a timeline the length of a football field, the 100,000 year history of modern humans would be less than a tenth of an inch from the goal line. So put it, put it in perspective. But, you know, it just, it's just, let's at least try to wrap our heads around deep time. Because the geological history of Alabama goes back more than a billion years, you know. So we're not going to get into all this, but we know that this earth has been 
the continents, as we say, slip sliding around. There's been a lot of movement. Alabama for many millions of years was well south of the equator, down around Brazil, uh, tropical. And we have the fossil evidence of that. You know, it just got north of the equator less than 200 million years ago. And the Gulf of Mexico didn't exist. You know, Alabama was encased in a, in a desert for a long time, sand dunes and all of that. And then the Gulf ripped open and the climate changed and so on and so forth. There's just been so many episodes of dramatic change in Alabama that are now evidenced in the rocks. So you end up with these, these maps, you know, and I say the geological map of Alabama looks like a white wall after a ferocious paintball fight, you know. People just bop in colors of every kind, and we end up with, according to the geological survey, this is the simplified view, there were, I believe, 120 chips of colors when you get down to the various outcrops of, of rock types. But when we look at it, we can see, you know, a couple basic things. One is this kind of a washboard ridges, you know, that kind of arc toward the Gulf of Mexico, at least from here. So this, this border here is going to be significant for us. And then we got this big jumble of so many different colors, that's significant. Then it kind of flattens out here in kind of monotonous color, and that's going to be significant. So we'll just break that down to some very, some very basics. This, this arc here, many of you know the term, it's, it's this line here, it's called the fall line. And it's, it's aptly named for a couple of reasons. One is there's a fairly dramatic drop in elevation. So this would be higher elevation. And then here, the um, rivers that flow across these would be dropping over that fall line. In fact, we are sitting on the fall line here in Auburn. We'll go back to that. Okay, so then below the fall line or toward the Gulf, the rest of it, most of Alabama in fact, from here down is coastal plain. Uh, upper coastal plain and lower coastal plain. Okay, now geologically speaking, these are color coded because these are the so-called old rock, ancient rock, from the Paleozoic era, the old life. Okay, so older than 250 million years. The green, the upper coastal plain, is a chunk of the Mesozoic era, which picks up at about 250 and goes to 65 million years ago. And then the lower coastal plain is the so-called new life, the Cenozoic. So the major eras of geologic history are all right here in Alabama. And interestingly, um, I don't know if I want to take the time, I brought a deck of cards. You take your deck of cards on a table and you splay them out, you know, the way a dealer does. That's how Alabama strata are um, in the sense that the bottom card, you know, if you splayed the deck and then tipped it, the bottom card is still showing, it's on the surface, and that would be analogous to the rocks up here. And so then the cards are becoming more and more recent as you move from the northeast to the southwest across the state. And we've got a couple periods like, you know, Jurassic. You know Jurassic from Jurassic Park, the dinosaur movie. The Jurassic is missing here. But it would be as if you had that splayed deck of cards and you took the Jurassic card and you just pulled it into the deck where it didn't stick up on the surface anymore. It's still there. And in fact, when some of the gas drilling was going on out in the Gulf of Mexico, when they drilled down about two and a half miles, boom, they hit the Jurassic. So it's there, if you think about the layers angled in the Gulf of Mexico covering a lot of them, it's not here, but if you go deep enough, you just hit that long card that got pulled into the deck a little bit. That's the way I look at it. So um, it's, just, it's just fascinating. We certainly wouldn't take the time to, to get into all the formations, but the main, the main point here is that the geological foundation of Alabama affects rivers in many, many different ways. And 
Also, the geology greatly affects the topography of the state. And so we end up thinking about these physiographic provinces. You see that same shape, the fall line right here, the, co the coastal plain. But what's left, that so-called hard rock, is divided into four provinces. The Piedmont that we're in, the Valley and Ridge up around Mount Chiha, uh, the Cumberland Plateau, and the Highland Rim. So again, this isn't going to be about that per se, but we're going to dig in a little bit and, and talk about what does that mean for rivers. So we've got the five provinces. We're one of a handful of states that have that many. So right away, we have a, a physical diversity that's rather unique in the country. There's some states with more. There's five, six, even seven. But um, so they're, on the surface, more diverse, you know. Uh, but um, our, our state has a lot of other things going for it with regard to its latitude, proximity to the Gulf of Mexico, all these other things that come to play that um, made it very attractive for human settlement and biota that we'll do next week. So we have the five provinces, and most of those rivers you saw you know, would flow over more than one province. That's going to be very significant. Um, even the Tom Bigby, which is largely in the coastal plain, has a little bit of headwater in the Highland Rim area, Cumberland Plateau. But you know, the Tennessee, it, it just rips through this area, has Cumberland Plateau, Rim, and a little bit of coastal plain. It's interesting, our coastal plain goes all the way to Tennessee on that side. Uh, the Black Warrior, certainly coming out of Cumberland Plateau, the Cahaba, the Coosa, the Tallapoosa. So they are rivers that are like two rivers. They are very different in their headwaters and in their, in their uh, lower reaches. And um, as they spill over that fallway, they have various physical features you can imagine. Shoals, like the Muscle Shoals up here, or waterfalls that you know, were used by people in a variety of ways. Um, they were both a blessing and a curse. They were obstacles for navigation, but they provided hydropower for all kinds of, of uh, developing economies. So people keyed into that. And of course, they knew about it beforehand, those that came from Europe and elsewhere. Uh, but even Native Americans keyed into it. And so that um, diversity will come into play here. So we're not sitting at a nice tablecloth, but again, a mental image. We'll just take a minute with this. You know, you might have to do some yoga breathing or something. Get yourself in the mood. You're in front of a, a table with a pure white flat tablecloth. And now you place your hands palm down on the table. You take a deep breath. Okay, now you just start to move your hands forward on the tablecloth. And what would happen would be that you would buckle that tablecloth, okay? So the buckling occurred right in here. You, by sitting there with your hands, are the continent of, of what became Africa. There was a huge collision, and that collision did a couple of things. At the impact, right where your hands are, where there's the most friction, the most uh, disturbance, you will be cooking and compressing, squishing, breaking, cracking, and changing the rocks that were there. And that is going to be the basic characteristics of this Piedmont. These are changed rocks, metamorphic rocks. Beyond your hands is the buckling and that is the valley and ridge. If you look at the southern Appalachians, they're just those parallel ridges, and they are very much like that tablecloth that you just jammed. And then on the back side of the table, you didn't, your arms aren't long enough, it gets flat again. So you look up here, that's why they call it a plateau and a rim. The strata here are very parallel. They're just like a layer cake, like they were, the way they were put down for the most part. So they're very buckled. Here they're just crushed, cooked, and so on. And so that's, that's in a nutshell, you know, why and how these provinces are different. 
and a little bit about how they form. It's, it's quite complex geology, as you might imagine. So this coastal plain here has been in various periods of time underwater, even, even as late as 65 million years ago. The Cretaceous was the highest sea levels on Earth ever. And Auburn was the beach. The sea came to the fall line, pretty much. And in fact, when they did uh, Sanford Little, the, the park where we play high school football, when they excavated to do, redo the road, they hit an oyster reef. It was 400 feet deep, just fossil oysters. Why? Because it was the beach. It was the reef. If you go down to Tuskegee, Union Springs, walk into a stream full of shark's teeth. That was two or 300 feet of, of water back in the day. So these fossils and the rock type are all clues to how Alabama has, has changed dramatically over time. And this is, this is just a little bit more, you can't see it exactly, but a little more 3D. You can see those ridges and you can see how flat that rim is and, and the fall line hills. And these rivers coming off of that are going to you know, get down in the lowlands where it flattens out and they meander a lot. Here they're more straight, they're faster, there's rapids, waterfalls, riffles, and we're going to talk about that. What does that mean for people and for critters? So, sure, please. Well, Birmingham certainly is, is on the edge of that valley and ridge. You know, as you know, Red Rock Mountain and all those, if you, if you were to look at that on satellite, Google Earth or something, they would be long parallel ridges. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Uh -huh. So I just made three maps. Actually, a buddy of mine, GIS guy, geographer up in Jacksonville, helped me. But, um, you know, just to give you the three views, the stage for these rivers. One, the geological map, just the outcropping of so many different kinds of rocks. Simplifying this to the major geological eras, you know, you have the big three with the fall line here. And then the same pattern, the Paleozoic, physiographically being divided into these five provinces. So when we think about what does that mean for, for river geology? I think, you know, I made some several points here to kind of wrap this up. But um, rivers flowed long before humans or any life on Earth. That's the other thing about it is rivers, you know, have been around as long as gravity and water, you know. Um, so rivers have flowed through and over, you know, what was Alabama, what became Alabama, even when it was you know, in all different states and places, um, as long as it was out of the sea. It was often inundated, but once it came out on dry land, we have many rivers, and there's evidence today of how those rivers flowed. It's phenomenal. Uh, we won't get into a lot of detail, but a lot of you have done a little bit of kayaking or canoeing, and you might have gone down into our coastal plain where there's a sandbar. And you will see strata in that sand. It's, it's what they call bedding. There's layers. And they have an angle to them, which go with the direction of flow. And water sorts things by particles, by energy. So coarse material would signify more rapid current, and finer material, slower current, right? And so in our sandstones today, ancient, ancient, beaches and riverbeds, we can tell if it was ocean or if it was river, and even what direction it flowed. And amazingly, most of our rivers did not even flow in the same direction that they do today. They flowed to the north and to the west because there was no Gulf of Mexico. So you really have to, you know, it, it's almost like science fiction, but when you get into it, it's so interesting how the earth has been changing, and then these rivers, as we say, they're on the stage. The stage slants this way, the rivers flow this way. The stage slants that way, the rivers 
accommodate and go the other way. And we have geological evidence for that. I've been in streams where you obviously know the direction the stream's flowing, but the cut sandstone on the side reveals that the river used to be going the other direction. So it's, it's quite interesting, quite complicated, but quite interesting. So we have this complex geological history, and we know that our strata are tilted with the oldest to the northeast and the youngest to the southwest. So Alabama has some very old rivers, and that always puzzled me a bit. You know, how do you know how old a river is? You know, you think of Old Man River. Well, how old is it? And I read an article, and it said the Black Warrior is one of the oldest rivers in the world. And I thought, okay, it's like that big chart, you know. How would you possibly know? So I'm going to just tease you with that one. When we do the Black Warrior, they have amazing geological evidence for dating a river. And so I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to get you to come back. So, but we have rivers that are in the same course. We talked about all the change, but eventually things settled down. We have rivers that have been flowing as they are today for millions, if not tens of millions of years. And if you're like me, and I know remember the first day we talked about where, regions where we're from and our identity, our landscape identity. The rivers where I grew up were just little baby rivers. There wasn't one over 10,000 years old because they were all just annihilated by the glaciers, you know? So think about a river that's orders of magnitude older in the same place. There's an old adage about teaching kids the water cycle, you know, that it, we don't make new water, kids, you know? We got what the dinosaurs drank. We're drinking what the dinosaurs drank. Well, that's true, but in Alabama, you're drinking it from the same river. It's the same place. You know, there's, there's, not only are we drinking that water, but the location, the flow of that. Um, there are uh, a lot of really cool geological clues to, to demonstrate how that works. So they've undergone many changes, and they're very physically diverse, and that's going to be so key for how we move forward. And then just to wrap it up to our break time, Geology affects a river's physical features. I think we know this when we mention all those shoals and waterfalls and riffles, or deep pools, quiet, meandering, soft bottom streams. You know, Alabama's got them all. We go from, from you know, quite high gradient, very fast, turbulent water on hard rock, all the way to this you know, very lazy, mucky, sandy bottom stream, and, and animals and people have adapted to all of that. So geology affects the river's physical features. Got hung up here a little bit. Somebody in the booth? Yeah. Okay. There we go. Whoop. Now we got them all. That's what you get for picking. Um, so geology affects a river's chemical features. So we, we think about those rocks, the same rocks, that some dissolve easier than others. Some are making the water very mineral rich. Some are making, keeping the water very mineral poor, soft water that we have um, in many places. So different, the way that the Physical, like the waterfall, affects oxygen levels of the stream. You know, it's always stirring it up and keeping it oxygen rich, or does it go quiet and slow and depress the oxygen with a lot of decomposition going on? So the physical and chemical features are, are greatly affected by geology, which, you know, when you put the three together, the physical, the chemical, it's obvious that the biota of our rivers would be greatly influenced by that. And so next week when we get into that, I'll just put it out there that Alabama has world-class biodiversity, just outstanding in many categories, ranked number one in the nation. And so we got to think about, well, you know, why is that? I think the answer is becoming obvious, but that, you know, there's just a very simple physical diversity leads to biological diversity. You know, and we'll talk, that's next week's topic. And then um, we'll take a break now, but we'll pick up where, how geology 
uh, affects those human settlement patterns. So we'll take about a 10 minute break and we'll, we'll see you at about a little after maybe 11, 11, and um, we'll get into people in rivers. Okay, we're going to resume. And uh, I had just a couple of announcements. One, one is that I brought in several books that I'm just going to lay out. In fact, I was intending to put them out before break, but you can linger or you can see me. But last week, and, and all of the whole article about the Alabama seal that is called An Invisible Seal Revealed came from the Alabama Heritage uh, number, need my specs here, fall of 2014, so it's fairly recent, about, about four or five years old, fall of 2014, and I will, I will leave it out here with the article open, you can just browse it, and some of you I think have subscriptions to this, you can go to the attic and dig it out, and, uh, but it's got a lot more in there than what I covered. And then I also brought uh, the citizen guides that I referred to, that I've drawn from for the course and, and the book I'm just finishing. This is five volumes of Citizen Guide to Alabama Rivers. So I was directing the Alabama Water Watch program that put those things together, and they will be here for you to browse. Please do not swipe my books. And there's some others up here that, um, well, one that's just a beauty, out of print now, done by the Office of Water Resources, Alabama, the River State. And it, it, again, it's short and it's a booklet, but it has absolutely gorgeous uh, photos, historical pictures, and really getting into some wonderful uh, history, human history. The thing that really struck me Back in 1992, the uh, Wheeler Wildlife Refuge, people went up there to see the Canada geese. <laughs> they were like really cool birds back then. Now it's like, can we get rid of these geese? So anyways, you can see how things change even in the short term. And then the geology, pretty much any river geology I ever knew, I learned from Jim Lacefield. And he wrote Lost Worlds in Alabama Rocks. I spent a weekend with him. Uh, he gave me oodles of scientific pubs and all that. But this is his second edition, and it has a lot about river geology in it, and a lot about just straight up geology. And Jim lives up Tuscumbia way in the Tennessee Valley. He and his wife Faye have uh, Keene, what is it called? Keene Creek Canyon. It's, it's eight several hundred acres that you can go and hike. And there's no charge. He, he maintains it, and it's open for anyone to enjoy. We're going to get into human settlement patterns. On that property are Paleo-Indian rock shelters that go back 10,000 years. And he's got them right there on his land. It's, it's incredible. Yes, sir? Where did you say this is located? King Creek, it's in Tuscumbia. Yeah. It, you know where that is, up in northwest Alabama? Mm -hmm. Tuscumbia was where Helen Keller was born, right? right. Yep, yep. That's a really neat area. Um, we'll get into that when we do the Tennessee River week after next. Uh, the last announcement before we jump in is that... Um, there's a project that Auburn University College of Agriculture has done with Alabama Public Television, and it's going to be, I believe, a four-part series on APT starting Monday night. And the first one we saw a pilot of last night uh, on campus, and it features water and streams and how it relates to agriculture. So that'll be Monday night. Um, Unfortunately, I have Dish TV out in the county, and I only get Georgia Public Television. I don't get APT. But if you do get APT, you might check your listing. I believe it's sometime, you know, in the evening. Anybody know? 7 o'clock? 
Nine o'clock? Yeah. Nine o'clock Monday, and, and maybe subsequent Mondays. I'm not sure the schedule, but it'll be a series about uh, agriculture and natural resource management done in partnership with Auburn's College of Ag, of which I've worked for 30 years, and, and um, Alabama Public Television. Okay, so we take the rest of our morning here to uh, pick up on that people in rivers. And, you know, again, whirlwind tour of uh, human history. The Paleo-Indian period, you know, began, some say this is conservative now to say 14,000 years before present. Some are pushing that to 17,000, even talking 20,000 for human settlement in North America. But we can be conservative and say we know we're in that 10 to 12,000 year ago range that humans came into what is now Alabama. One of the main things, the glaciers were, were retreating. This area was like clean slate. It was like Arctic tundra. But that glacier, as it advanced and stopped about here, pushed a lot of biota into the southeast and became the refuge of those species. When the glaciers retreated, a lot of them just stuck around and said, hey, I like Alabama better than New York anyways. Anyways, we, that's part of our huge diversity is that we received a lot and we became a center for recolonizing anything that was in the wake of the, the glacier. But when people came, and people have theories about sources, many different sources, but I just read a recent one. Not only was there a land bridge at the Bering Straits where humans crossed over from Asia, but they're now finding underwater campsites and believe that they did have some sort of boat that they at least followed the shore. It'd be a lot easier than walking over all those slippery rocks with who knows what's in the woods there. So they're feeling now that many came via water, uh, but, but did find their way here because of many advantages in terms of climate and food. You know, nuts and berries and fish and mussels and all kinds of goodies out of the, out of the water environment. Um, the, there's a pre-paleo culture, but paleo-Indian, the term, is kind of defined by this particular projectile point called the Clovis point. And it was a fluted point, meaning it had a little groove here. It's believed it was to allow a blood trail. When you speared something, instead of just sealing it up, it, it created a channel for the blood to come out onto the snow or the ground and to track an animal a little better. But um, some of you think you have problems with armadillos in your yard, you know. You know, they chew up your yard a little bit, the golf course, you know, big whoop. These guys had to contend with some, some mammals that we don't have here anymore. And um, trying to get one of those little stone points through that, <laughs> through that hide would be a chore, I'm sure. But um, at any rate, up in uh, North Alabama, uh, this is, you can see from the walkway, another place, a cool place to visit up in extreme northeast Alabama called Russell Cave. And it's got the, the longest, they believe, in the whole east coast, or at least the southeast, the longest continuous human habitation, which, which went from an archaic period uh, all the way up to contact period into the 1600s. There's some evidence that humans at least seasonally use these caves. And these rock shelters are natural. Again, it's a function of geology. A lot of these sandstone uh, formations, you know, there was a resistant sandstone cap on a more soft, erodible limestone. And when it caved, it made a really nice shelter. So early uh, settlers, and in terms of Native Americans, took advantage of that. And in the woodland period, which came after that archaic, mainly designated by more sophisticated pottery, 
projectile points. And in the woodland, uh, more advanced canoe design, uh, more advanced agriculture, settled down, you know, uh, sedentary agriculture with villages and more sophisticated societies with, with tribes and chiefs and, you know, proto-governments, if you will. And um, those uh, Native Americans, of course, used rivers a lot. And in this period, in the woodland period, um, you can see even this picture here that's on a river bank. If you look at it, the archaeological sites in Alabama of the woodland period, you, you almost don't even need a river map. If you just put the sites on the map, it, you see the rivers. I mean, they, they hardly deviated from a river because of what we talked about earlier, the lifeblood of food, of transportation, of drinking water, and all of that. So it's very, very common to have uh, large settlements, like not too far from here, just over in Tallahassee, on the Tallapoosa River is Tuckabatchee, which was the, one of the Upper Creek capital cities, if you will, settlements, um, right on the Tallapoosa River. And in fact, uh, the, the streams of South Auburn drain into Ufabi Creek, which goes through the Tuskegee Forest area and comes out below Tallahassee, right at Tuckabatchee. So it was very common for Native Americans to use where fairly large creeks met large rivers. That was like primo, because you had two avenues to move on. You had the different biota in the different stream types. You had the alluvial, you know, the floodplain soils, which were very productive for the three sisters, beans, corn, and, um, and squash. So um, they were in the later woodland period, it was noted uh, to have some very sophisticated um, pottery. This piece here, one of the most precious pieces that came out of Moundville over on the Tom Bigby River, and they often had aquatic themes. That's believed to be a wood duck, but I will go so far as to say duck, okay? But yeah, I could kind of see wood duck in there. But there's other vessels with frogs, with turtles, with fish. You know, it was such an important part of their life. And I read another article recently on the Tennessee River. They've uncovered middens, you know, the garbage heap of the Native Americans. One midden had over 50,000 mussel shells of over 50 species of mussel. So the mussels, you know, were just very, very important uh, food items uh, for Native Americans. And a lot of people have asked me, can you eat one of those mussels, you know? And I thought, well, you know, I wouldn't necessarily chew into one myself, but people have for many, many years depended on them. If you go down toward the coast, they, you know, Dauphin Island has a big midden and it's all oyster, oyster shells. So it, it was just uh, showing how people use the aquatic resource at hand. Wherever there's protein, there's going to be people chomping on it. So the Mississippian period was like a subset of this woodland. You see, it was like the uh, thousand year to about 1,000 to 1,550, about 550 year period, the very end of uh, pure Native American culture before European contact. And that's where things just flourished in terms of the mound building culture. They believed there was a lot of uh, trade and communication, not only of goods, but ideas with Mesoamerica, the step pyramids of the Maya, of the Aztecs, you can follow those mounds that came out of Mesoamerica, and they went right up the Mississippi River and spilled over into Alabama in the Moundville. Moundville, this is just obviously diagrammatic, but Moundville hit its apex about 1325, so we're still a couple hundred years before any uh, Europeans hit shore. It was considered to be the Big Apple of all of Eastern North America. It had many complexes and, and mounds, ceremonial mounds, uh, and a fairly sophisticated uh, society. So all of this happened before uh, any European. And 
And when you put it in perspective, even if you go for the more conservative 10,000 years, let's say 10,000 years, people are in Alabama. The first European, we'll get to the Spanish in just a minute, is about 1550. So we've had about 500 years of white people, and we've had about 10,000 years of Native Americans. So if you do the math, you know, again, like that deep time and the analogy of the football field and all that, think about 95% of all the time that people have been in Alabama has been pure Native American people. So they're, they're you know, we were just talking at break, all the names of the rivers, uh, many, many towns and all of our culture is deeply affected by that Native American culture. And even before DeSoto stepped foot, Native Americans were easily traveling from the Great Lakes into Alabama by water. They, in fact, you could sail today from the Great Lakes to Alabama with less than 100 miles of portage for thousands of miles of water travel. I mean, when you can come down the Mississippi or the Ohio, get into the Tennessee, go back up into the Hawassi, jump over into the Ustanala, and come down the Coosa to Montgomery and to Mobile, the Native Americans had that down pat. We figured it out, or we copied, or we used those travels when we got more sophisticated vessels. But water travel was, was the name of the game back then. And so that's just a little bit about Native American. When we come into the first contact, um, here's Hernando de Soto and his, and his gang uh, meeting uh, Native Americans. Quite a, quite a uh, scene here. It almost makes you think that things were going to work out well. Um, but even just staring at this picture, you know, and you think about if someone from Jupiter just landed here today and they had technologies that were so vastly beyond what we had, you know, how we would feel, you know, our whole worldview would be in turmoil. And here's people with horses and dogs and guns and metals and different technologies that they didn't even dream of, you know, and what that must have meant for those people that had lived here for thousands of years. And, and sure enough, you know, DeSoto was known to be particularly brutal. He, he kept these dogs which, which terrified Native Americans, and he, he sicked them on them on a regular basis. There was a lot of pillaging. The, so-called holy grail of Alabama archaeology is where was that last battle between Chief Tuscaloosa and Hernando de Soto, which is believed to be somewhere down where the Alabama and Tom Bigby rivers come together, a place called Mobilla or Movilla. It comes under different spellings. No one knows for sure where it is. They're, they're honing in on, there's some theories about where it might have been, but um, very, bloody conflict and um, just a lot of tragedy uh, between those early contact periods. The, the Spanish were here first, you might say, 1550, thereabouts. De Soto traveled around the state. There's evidence of that. Up on the Coosa River, there were helmet crests and spurs and other artifacts that were clearly Spanish that were found not that long ago up around Rome, Georgia. So we know, you know, his travels approximately, Tennessee Valley, uh, down the Tom Bigby, um, the Coosa. The French uh, came in from, largely from Mobile Bay. You can't see maybe all the terms. This is an old French map. So everything's in French. But, um, you know, this is very generalized history, but we might give the 1600s to the, to the French in terms of using Mobile as the gateway. And of course, they ended up with vast territory to the west of us, which Thomas Jefferson bought. I think it was 1802, was it, or 1803? But um, the first settlements of St. Stephen's were an old French fort of Tom Beckby up here in what's now Washington County. And the French 
you know, found their way up the Tom Bigby and a little bit of the Black Warrior, but they, they had a, a settlement out there which made it to the state seal and made it into the 1800s. Uh, but the French, you know, and the Brits and the Spanish were, were going at it here and back home. The Seven Years' War, revolutions in those countries were all swirling around. So there was a lot, a lot of, you know, intrigue, various treaties with different factions of Native Americans that were fighting with each other. Uh, the name, you know, we have the four major tribes in our state, the Creeks by far with the most territory, you know, for most of East Alabama. Uh, the Cherokee tend to be in the North Tennessee Valley. And then the Choctaw and Chickasaw were more West Alabama, Mississippi line. And those names even were not names that they identified with. Those were names that were more confederacies of those disparate tribes that came after contact, after European contact. They were kind of thrown together uh, for survival. And so there's, there were a lot of intertribal war and then you layer on the fighting between the French, British, and Spanish, and you had a holy mess here for a couple hundred years. But Native Americans largely lost, and um, though they are present with us today, we can't neglect that fact. But I was thinking about this yesterday, and not to disparage uh, religion by any stretch, but Desmond Tutu, you know, the Archbishop of South, South Africa, he put it bluntly when he said about colonial history. Whenever Europeans came to Asia, to Africa, to Latin America, to North America, he said, when you came, if we go back just a little bit, you see here's, here's the conquistador and here's the priest, okay? And he said, Tutu said, you know, he said, you guys came and you had the Bible and we had the land and you said, let's pray. But when we opened our eyes, we had the Bible and you had the land, you know. That, that's the way he put it, you know. And kind of sad but true, that's largely what happened. So um, the French, you know, we were talking at break, uh, they helped the American settlers a bit in our revolution, so we kind of liked the French. They had this utopian type settlement out there in West Alabama ended up on the state seal. And um, we had a governor of Alabama in the 1820s that personally escorted Lafayette down the Alabama River by steamboat, brought him to Cahaba, you know, one of the early capitals of the state. Um, from the French, though, they eventually lost out to the British, as did the Spanish. We got Florida, although for some reason, got that panhandle in the way. I don't know why Alabama doesn't have the much larger coast there, but uh, what was Spanish Florida stayed the state of Florida, and we got a little bitty outlet to the Gulf through Mobile. But this is just a scene from American settlers that finally the last stand of the Creek Nation at Horseshoe Bend, not too far, not too far from here, up uh, you know, in Tallapoosa County, heading up toward Mount Cheeha. You can go see that site. Uh, but this is when Andrew Jackson came in about 18, right after the War of 1812, and overwhelmed the, the Creek Nation. And so from that point, in, especially into the 1830s, there was mass removal of Native Americans across the Mississippi River. So. That kind of ushered in the use, I mean, the flatboat was a primitive vessel that a lot of settlers used. You had to get three or four burly guys with poles to dig in and walk up the deck to move it. Some, they got a sail here. But a lot of these flatboats were done like gondolas or, you know, big oars. Um, the flatboat era, you know, could be from whenever people first got here on up until about 1820. Because in 1820, one of the first steamboats kind of rolled in from Boston. And this is kind of like 
what I was saying about how much of a shock it must have been for Native Americans to meet all these new technologies. The Europeans that came here came with a lot of stuff from the old country. And we were making steamboats up in New York and New England, you know, way back. I mean, uh, pretty much the very early Industrial Revolution, uh, back in the very late 1700s, early 1800s, started to revolutionize the way business was done, um, that is, daily life. And these steamboats, you know, just kind of took over. When you think of antebellum Alabama, you, you got to think of a steamboat, right? Because we had these big rivers. This is in our archive seen on the Alabama River. And I believe this is at Montgomery. Have you, have you been down to the docks in Montgomery? They have the old ramp. They still have the abutments and all where they rolled 500 pound baled cotton onto these boats. Of course, primarily slaves did that. And this is still, there's remnants of this still in Montgomery down by the docks, you know, where they, where they, um, where they docked that, uh, that steamboat, I forgot her name now. You can go for dinner cruises and stuff. And there's, there's uh, placards that give you the history. But these boats, you know, they started out being very functional on our rivers, moving grain, moving cotton, especially with that, with that river seal. You know, it's like we didn't realize when the Industrial Revolution started how high demand cotton was in London, in Europe. People were making fortunes growing cotton and getting it to Europe or to the Northeast US. But the steamboat themselves morphed into what were called floating palaces. So the upper deck were for the elite. You see these guys just lounging around, or these guys are all just lounging around. Everybody else is doing the work. But I've read about where they had maybe three or four bands. They even had, they pulled barges where people could dance. There was another side where you could shoot alligators. Um, you had fine food. You had all the great luxuries of life. So here's, here's the haves and here's the have-nots. And the boat did both. It moved, you know, what were worth millions of dollars of cargo. And people had these grand parties up top. So in the smaller streams, and there's still a lot of remnants of this. This is a remnant of an old mill on Hel Elkahatchee Creek, which is up in Alex City, flows into Lake Martin now. And uh, Russell Lands refurbished this whole thing. You can go to that mill today, and there's a brand new water wheel. But I, I was just fascinated. You know, we won't get into all the details, but you know, water power, you've got this turning shaft. Um, so using our abundant granite in this part of the state, there was uh, when our first uh, state geologist traveled Alabama. He saw tradesmen making wonderful granite millstones up around Dadeville. Um, lots of granite between there and Alex City up into Clay County. So these, of course, were, were driven by that shaft and gears to grind corn. So there were a lot of so-called grist mills. Other grains were ground. The one that really fascinated me were the streamside forges. And I thought, how could you move a big hammer up and down? And if you could picture a shaft like this, the one I saw, even simpler, think of a four-spoked wheel that turned, just these big old spokes. And they put the hammer on a fulcrum where the handle of the hammer was here on a fulcrum. And one of those things would come, and they were rounded. So it was just enough to raise that hammer, and then it would drop off. And the next spoke would come, and boom, boom. So free, free hammer. And that guy would have his fire, get that metal molten, and bring it over to his anvil. And that hammer would beat it into a plow or a uh, you, you know, utensil of some kind. So water power you know, was used to drive forges, foundries, and mills. And of course, we're in the heart of it here. That's why we have Wright's Mill Road, Moore's Mill Road, you know, over at Beans Mill. Um, the fall line, as I mentioned earlier, became, you know, a spot where those boats couldn't get beyond. 
navigationally because of that rapids and, and elevation drop, but it became the trading center. All the raw materials from the uplands, the minerals, the timber, the furs, and then the agricultural crops could come and load on those boats. So that's where all the business happened. That's where all of our big cities, if you look at the Piedmont cities like Tuscaloosa, like Montgomery, like Columbus, you know, Columbus in the day was second only to Richmond for industry. And it was hugely prosperous right there at our fall line, what we would call Phoenix City on our side or Columbus. And you could take it on up all the way to Richmond and Washington, D.C. If you look at human settlement on the East Coast, the big cities are often right on the fall line. And it came from these early days. It's just where people landed and made a lot of money. So we then come to this teeming of the rivers. I guess, I guess we have to leave it at that. We've gotten to almost quarter of, so I don't want to um, go over time. We will pick up on taming of the rivers. And let me just say, in a nutshell, to me, prior to this, we were engineering our boats and our ways of dealing with the rivers as they were. But then suddenly, people started thinking, hey, let's change the whole river, you know? Why are we, why are we making a better boat? Let's make a better river. So that's what we'll pick up next week. We'll see it. Thank you.